So we'll try to understand now the management tool. If you if you remember in the beginning when we are trying to understand what are the different tools, what the company they are using to integrate sustainability into their day to day activity, those are of three types. One is impact assessment tool, second one is the management tools and third one is the reporting tool. So under the category of the impact assessment tool in last two session we are understanding what is LCA. In this class we will understand what is the management tool, one of the management tool that is designed for environment. Now going further let us see where the design for environment fits into our goal of the sustainability or the journey of the sustainability. Now what is the primary goal? The primary goal over here is that sustainability that is responsibility towards the future generation. Now what is the basic approach it is being followed that is industrial ecology, we try to imitate the, imitate the nature or mimic the nature to conserve and reuse the resources. So in this case one we get into the imitation of the ecosystem, we get into the eco industrial park, closing the material loops, energy efficiency few of the action points. Apart from this we can get into the green technology. And green technology talks about pollution avoidance rather than pollution treatment. This green technology again can be into pollution prevention, we can get into the green processes or we get into the design for environment green design. It means we from the design stage of the product we the so called uh, sustainability concern, green concern or whatever way you put it that gets incorporated into the design of the product. And here this design for environment is again into two types, one we do the product design, we incorporate design in such a way that there is a recycling, there is a place for the recycling to promote the closed material loops and second one is the dematerialization which typically doing with the less, how we can design the product that we have to use less of the resources. So design for environment is a design approach and this design approach is to reduce the overall human, uh, overall human health and environmental impact of a product process or service. So this is a design approach which is typically used to reduce the overall human health, environmental impact of a product, process or service. And this impacts are considered across the life cycle. So it is not about designing for a specific part of the product life cycle, typically it is decided ex across the life cycle of the product. And if the DFE is being planned well, it is being designed well, uh, the it is being incorporated in the product design in a better way, then it improves and maintains the product quality cost, reduce the environmental impact. And DFA expand the traditional manufacturer focus from the production distribution of its product to the closed loop cycle. The origin is in 1970s and Papanek 1971, he challenged the designer to face the social and environmental responsibility instead of the commercial interest rather than only getting into the commercial interest in the product design also to incorporate the social and environmental responsibility. There were many influential books published in 1990s about the need and the benefit of DFEs. It created by in by number of electronic firm in 1992 and they were attempting to build a environmental awareness in the product development. And American Electrical Associ Electronics Association was the first initiator of DFE. Initial guideline of DFE is made by a NGO East Meet West. This is the NGO based out of New York. And there are various terminology used for this environmental friendly design approach that can be green design, eco design, sustainable design or the eco friendly design. Now what are the driving forces for 
adopting or implementing this design for environment. The first one is risk management to say whatever the risk associated with the product by incorporating all this in the design stage we can manage the risk. This is a action towards the product stewardship. The consumer gets satisfied with the incorporation of this and get a better product. There is a competitive pressure other companies doing it and getting improving their brand into a better one. Then at some point of time in order to do a compliance with the standard few company they take this as the DAP as one of the tool and in the biggest uh, scale the end goal is the sustainable development and sustainability for the DAP should be part of the DAP should be part of the uh, action point or part of the intervention. Now what are DAP strategy? There are four strategy of uh, DAP incorporating environmental motives to improve the product design, improve the technology and design tactics, incorporating eco efficiency into the design tactics and minimize the environmental economic cost to the consumer. So, if you look at the uh, first two is mostly into uh, keeping the space for recycling and how recycling uh, whatever the recycling resources or the recycling product how this can be part of the product. And second two is mostly about the dematerialization that is in, in incorporating the eco efficiency into the design tactics so that we pr uh, produce more with less of resources and minimize the environmental economic cost to the consumer. This is the uh, DAP practices that is we design for environmental processing and manufacturing that is one stage where the DAP is being practices where we get the raw material extraction, processing and manufacturing. Then this DAP can be part of the packaging getting into the environmental friendly packaging. Then design for disposal and reuse where we address the, the product design is such that in the at the end of life of the product the uh, impact the human health impact or the environmental impact is less and designed for also the energy efficiency how we should the how, how it should be the product design or technology that it can be more energy efficient. So this is the uh, product development process it starts from planning to concept development, system level design, detailed design, testing and refinement and production ramp up. And here the role of DFE get mapped into the each stage of the product development process. So planning mostly with the DFE goals and team. Then in concept development and system level de uh, design the DFE and material guidelines can be given. In detailed design and testing and refinement we can assess the impact and refine the designs and production ramp up typically improve the DAP process. So DAP can be integrated into the standard product development process. This is the uh, DAP process. So in case in the stage of the product planning typically the DAP agenda is set. In case of concept development we identify the potential environmental impact and select the material and DAP guideline. In the system level design we apply the DFE guideline into the initial design. Then after this DFE guideline is applied to the initial design again the in environmental impact is assessed and then refine the design if needed compared to the DFE goal if the environmental impact is, is more or it is not matching with the goal the design is being refined and again the again assessing the environmental impact and finally reflect the DAP on the process and result that is in the process improvement. Then let us take the uh, let us take few of the examples to understand this DAP or let us say few of the case study where this DAP is being used to uh, make it a better product which is environmental friendly or there is impact to the health. So typically Herman Miller they are into the office chairs and these are the three variant of their office chair which is and they are into the providing the ergonomic chairs and these are the three variant of the office chair that given by the Herman Miller. Now what is Herman Miller's environmental goal? They tried for zero landfill, 
zero hazardous waste generation, zero air emission, zero process water use, 100 percent green electrical energy use, 100 percent sales from the DFE product and company building constructed to the minimum lead saver certification. So, we will see that what they have done in term of the DFE product. So, they take the take in the case this is the case of the set to multipurpose chair and we will see that how based on uh, this de uh, design for environment tool how they have made it it is a environmental friendly chair. So, this is this typical chair is environmental friendly and non toxic produce of non toxic material which is 41 percent aluminum then 41 percent polypropylene 18 percent steel that is by weight and it is used produced from use of the recycled material 44 percentage from the recycled material that is by weight 23 percent recycled post consumer and 21 percent post industrial. Then there is a less material content this is lighter than the other task, task chairs that is easy to disassemble that is 86 percent easily separable material and when you talk about the recyclability of this 92 percent by weight can be recycled and products line uses 100 percent of the green, pow uh, green power, green energy, no air or water emission release in the production and this can be returnable and recyclable packaging. So, whatever the packaging they use that is also returnable to the company and also this can be recyclable. So, if you look at starting from the materials they have used that is of environmental friendly non-toxic and made from the recycled material. They have used green energy, there is no air and water emission and also the packaging what they have used that can be recycled. Now, when it get into the Herman Miller's DFE protocol, so they have moved beyond the regulatory compliance to thoroughly evaluate the new product design and possibly that is how we get what we are checking in the previous slide how they have made a environmental friendly chair. So, here what they have done in their protocol they are looking at the material chemistry and the safety of the inputs what they are using for the product. What chemicals are in there in the material specification are they safest available then they consider the disassembly is it possible to take the product apart at the end of their useful life to recycle their materials and recyclability do the material contain recycled content can the material be recycled to end the uh, at the end of the products useful life and LC is that optimize the product base entire life cycle. So, based on that this is for the their DFE assessment method where 33.3 percent is their material chemistry, recycle content is 8.4 percent, disassembly is 33.3 and recyclable is 25.4 percent. Now, the second example what we take is Nike grind and this is one of the initiative where they are scrap whatever the scrap is coming out of the post using the product what are the product that those are being developed from those scrap. So, this Nike uh, uh, grind is part of Nike's 30 years commitment to the holistic sustainability and uh, this is for more circular future and it was what were once was considered waste typically from the waste there is a new opportunity to create a new product or a different product from the waste of the one of the product. So, in this Nike grind what is being done is they, they collect the recycled material developed by Nike whatever their product Nike product they collect the recycled material from their product which is composed of pre consumer manufacturing scrap, recycled post consumer shoe from the reuse a shoe program and whatever the unsellable footwear what they could not sell in the market that also get into the recycled material. So, there are three component of the recycled material what they use in the Nike grind program that is 
part of it is the pre-consumer manufacturing scrap, what is the scrap generated during manufacturing. Then the post-consumer scrap, post-consumer sue that is the scrap what they get from the reuse a sue program. And finally, whatever the footwear, unsellable footwear that they also get into the scrap. And the purpose of this goal or this program is to eliminate the waste and close the loop on the Nike product life cycle. So, if you get into the, the profile of this Nike product, 70 percent of all Nike shoes and apparel now contain some recycled material, at least 75 percent of the Nike shoe they have some of the recycled material. And Nike grind is also used in athletic and play surface like running track, turf field, playground surfaces, courts, weight room flooring and carpet underlay. And since its, its inception, Nike, Nike grind has been used over 1 billion square feet of the sports surface in total and 130 million pound of Nike grind have been recycled into partners products since 1992. This is some of the uh, example what is being made from uh, Nike grind that is the basketball court and Samuelson track and field which is being created from the scrap that is generated under the Nike grind. Then the second example what comes again from Nike is Nike Air. This is the product, this is the one of their shoe variant and this is considered as the most uh, sustainable innovation because it is being produced from sustainable materials, computational design and advanced manufacturing tools. And 99 percent of the recoverable dye water to be recycled, whatever they the dye coloring process, whatever water they use for the product out of those total water consumption, 99 percent can be recoverable by to be recycled which can be recycled further. Then the air sole innovation they did that is from 50 percent of the recycled manufacturing waste, the sole what they have planned for the so the air sole that is from the 50 percent of the recycled manufacturing waste. And Nike Air manufacturing innovation facility, they divert more than 95 percent of the manufacturing waste from the landfill. Then we get into the uh, packaging solution given by Puma that is known as the clever little bag and this is the design for environment is being incorporated in the packaging. So, this is designed by UBS Behar and Fuse project and they develop a game changing packaging system and the goal was to reduce the footprint and build on their initiative towards cleaner, greener and safer practices for sustainability. They design a innovative solution called clever little bag and the solution is reusable for the consumer and fully recyclable at the end of its life. The impact because of this better packaging, they use 65 percent less cardboard than the standard box, no laminated printing, no tissue paper, less weight and space in shipping. And new reusable bag replaced the polythene retail bag made of recycled pet which is also recyclable. So, whatever the reusable bag they have created that is also recyclable. The impact of this clever little bag is that approximately 8500 tons less paper consume in this packaging, 20 million megajoule of electricity save in the because it is less of consumption less of production, 1 million liter, uh, 1 million liter less fuel oil used, 1 million liter water conserved and this is the liter of diesel safe because in the logistic uh, process and rep, uh, replacing the traditional shopping bags the difference in weight will almost save 275 tons of plastic. And look at the impact the small little bag that is created and it is a little bag can have such a big impact and that is why possible this is known as the clever little bag. Now the other example is Dyson air blade hand dryer 
and this is from the German Federal Environmental Agency UBA Germany. They have certified this as a most environmental friendly drying method comparing with paper towel, cotton towel and other standard dryers that those are available in the market. It is the energy saving from this Dyson air blade hand dryer is 80 percent, 64 percent faster. It removes 99.9 percent air bacteria and it produces up to 79 percent less CO2 than other hand dryer and it able to dry 18 pairs of hand for the price of the single paper towel. So, it is not only environmental friendly, it is also has a implication on the cost whatever the price of the single paper towel with the same price the, with the help of this dryer the drying is done for the 18 pairs of the hand. Now summarizing this session, uh, so we have tried to understand what is this design for environment tool, what are the different, we have taken the different product examples and understand that how design being incorporated is creating less environmental impact and less health impact. So while summarized, we have taken this uh, picture from Conrad and Jessica's in from their eco design and the 10 golden rules uh, paper which gives that in the production process what the individual process play in the overall design and production of the product. So, there are many uh, parameters which is not coming out very clearly in the slide, but if you look at for a specific product there are many individual processes they plays a role. And if you look at the one which is little bit raised over on the uh, top left hand, uh, left hand side of the slide the typical in this pie chart the typical pie is representing the environment and which says that environment has also began to play important role in this diagram that in the process in the in the production uh, apart from other individual process environment is also playing a role and if any piece is being missing from this diagram pro, pro, possibly production will not occur and if it, so it is not about taking out environment the product would be a successful one or the product would be a feasible one that is what entirely the uh, session what we have discussed that summarizes that environment has to be incorporated in design, environment, uh, environment has to be incorporated in the process, environment that has to incorporate in the usage of the product and finally environment has to incorporate it when the end of life happens for the product. Thank you.